Then, when it was the twenty-sixth night, she continued, I have heard, O auspicious king, that the young merchant told the Christian. When I entered and sat down, before I knew it, the lady had come forward, ornamented with henna and wearing a crown studded with pearls and other gems. When she saw me, she smiled at me, hugged me to her breast, and setting her mouth on mine she started to suck my tongue as I sucked hers. Have you really come to me? she said. I am your slave, I replied. She said, you are welcome. From the day that I saw you, I have enjoyed neither sleep nor food. It is the same with me, I told her, and we sat and talked, while I kept my head bent downwards out of bashfulness. It was not long before she produced a meal with the most splendid of foods, ragouts, and meats fried with honey, together with stuffed chickens. We both ate until we had had enough and the servants then brought me a bowl and a jug. I washed my hands and we used musk-infused rose water to perfume ourselves, after which we sat talking. She then recited these lines. Had I known of your coming, I would have spread out my heart's blood and the pupils of my eyes. I would have strewn my cheeks to welcome you, so that you might have walked on my eyelids. She kept telling me of her sufferings, while I told her of mine and her love had so strong a grip on me that all my wealth was as nothing beside it. We then started to play, dallying with each other, and exchanging kisses until nightfall. At this point, the maids produced us a complete meal with food and wine, and we drank until midnight, when we went to bed. I slept with her until morning, and never in my life have I experienced a night like that. In the morning I got up and threw the kerchief with the dinars under the bed for her. I then said goodbye and went out, leaving her in tears. Sir, she said, when shall I see this handsome face again? I shall be with you in the evening, I replied. When I left, I met the donkey man who had brought me there the day before. He was standing at the door waiting for me and so I got on the donkey and went with him to Khan Masr, where I dismounted and gave him half a dinar. Come at sunset, I told him, and he agreed. I then had breakfast and went out to collect the money for my goods. I prepared a roast lamb for the lady and took some sweetmeats, after which I summoned a porter, put the food in his basket and paid him his hire, before going back to my own affairs, tending to them until sunset. The donkey man turned up, and taking fifty dinars in a kerchief, I went to the lady's house, where I found that the servants had washed down the marble, polished the brass, filled the lamps and lit the candles as well as making ready the food and straining the wine. When the lady saw me, she threw her arms around my neck and said, You left me desolate. The meal was then produced and we ate our fill, after which the maids cleared away the table and brought out the wine. We went on drinking until midnight, and then we went to the bedroom and slept until morning. Then I got up, gave her the fifty dinars as before and left. The donkey man was there and I rode to the Khan, where I slept for an hour. After getting up, I made preparations for the evening meal, getting ready walnuts and almonds on a bed of peppered rice, together with fried colocasia roots, and I bought fruits, fresh and dried, as well as sweet-smelling flowers. When I had sent these off, I went back to the Khan, and later I rode as usual with the donkey man to the house, taking fifty dinars wrapped in a kerchief. After I had entered we ate, drank and then slept until morning, when I got up, gave the lady the kerchief and then rode back as usual to the Khan. Things went on like this for a time, until I woke up one morning and found that I had no money left at all. The devil has done this, I said to myself, and I recited these lines. When the rich man becomes poor, his splendor goes, just as the setting sun turns pale. If he is absent, no one talks of him. When present, he has no standing in his clan. He walks through the markets covering his face, while in the desert he sheds copious tears. By God, he may be with his own people, but even so, the poor man is a stranger. I went out of the Khan and walked up Bain Alcasrain Street, going on until I reached Bab Zawela. There I found a great crowd of people blocking the gate. As was fated, I saw a soldier and jostled him unintentionally. I touched his pocket with my hand, 
and on feeling it, I discovered that my fingers were resting on a purse there. Realizing that this was within my grasp, I removed it, but the soldier felt that his pocket had become lighter, and when he put his hand into it, he found it empty. He turned towards me, lifted his club and struck me on the head, knocking me to the ground. I was surrounded by people, who held on to the bridle of the man's horse, exclaiming, Do you strike this young man like that because you have been jostled? He's a damned thief. The soldier shouted at them. I then came to my senses and found people saying, This is a handsome young man, and he has not taken anything. Some of them believed this but others did not, and there was a great deal of argument. People were pulling me and wanting to free me from the soldier but, as fate had decreed, the Wali, the police chief and his men came through the gate and found the people crowding around me and the soldier. When the Wali asked what the trouble was, the soldier said, Sir, this man is a thief. I had in my pocket a blue purse with twenty dinars in it, and while I was stuck in the crush, he took it. The Wali asked whether there had been anyone with him. No, he said, and the Wali shouted to his police chief, who laid hold of me, leaving me no place to hide. Strip him, ordered the Wali, and when they did, they found the purse and my clothes. The Wali took it opened it, and when he counted the money, he found in it twenty dinars, just as the soldier had said. He shouted angrily to the guards, who brought me before him. Tell the truth, young man, he said. Did you steal this purse? I hung my head and said to myself, I can say that I didn't steal it, but it has been found on me, and yet if I confess that I did steal it, then I am in trouble. So I raised my head and said, yes, I took it. The Wali was astonished when he heard me say this and he called for witnesses who, when they came, testified to what I had said. All this was happening by the Zuela gate. The Wali then gave orders to the executioner, who cut off my right hand. Afterwards the soldier felt pity for me and, thanks to his intercession, the Wali left me and went on his way. The people stayed around me and gave me a glass of wine, while the soldier gave me his purse, saying, you are a handsome young man, and you should not be a thief. I recited the lines. By God, I am no robber, my trusty friend, and neither am I a thief, O best of men. The misfortunes of time cast me down suddenly, as my cares, temptation, and poverty increased. It was not you but God who shot the arrow that struck the royal crown from off my head. After he had given me the purse, the soldier left me, while I went off myself, after wrapping my hand in a scrap of cloth and putting it inside the front of my clothes. I wasn't feeling well and I had turned pale as the result of my experience. I walked unsteadily to the lady's house, where I threw myself down on the bed. The lady looked at my altered color and asked, What is paining you? Why do I see that your manner has changed? I have a headache, I replied and I'm not well. She was distressed and disturbed on my behalf. Don't distress me, she said, but sit up, raise your head and tell me what has happened to you today, as it is clear from your face that you have a tale to tell. Please don't talk, I said, but she wept and said, I fear that you have finished with me, for I can see that you are not your usual self. I kept silent, and although she went on talking, I made no reply. This went on until nightfall, when she brought me food, but I would not eat it lest she see me eating with my left hand. I don't want to eat just now, I told her, but she persisted. Tell me what happened to you today, and why you are careworn and broken-hearted. I shall tell you soon in my own time, I said. Then she brought me wine and said, Take this, for it will remove your cares. You have to drink and then you can tell me your news. Must I really tell you? I asked. Yes, she replied. If that is so, I said, then give me to drink with your own hand. She filled a glass and drank it, and then filled it again and handed it to me. I took it from her with my left hand and, with tears pouring from my eyes, I recited. When God will some fate to befall a man, a man of intelligence, having all his senses, he deafens him and blinds his heart, drawing out his intelligence as one pulls a hair. When what he has decreed then comes to pass, 
he gives it back that its owner may take note. On finishing these lines, I took the glass in my left hand and wept. She gave a loud shriek and asked, Why are you weeping, and so distressing me? Why did you take the glass in your left hand? I have a boil on my right hand, I said. Show it to me, she said, and I will burst it for you. It's not ready for that, I said, adding, Don't pester me, for I'm not going to show it to you yet. I then drank the glass, and she went on pouring out wine for me, until I was overcome by drunkenness and fell asleep on the spot. She then looked and saw an arm without a hand. On searching me, she found the purse with the gold. She felt more grief than anyone had ever experienced before, and the pain of this grief for me stayed with her until morning. When I woke up, I found that she had prepared me a dish of four boiled chickens, and she gave me a glass of wine. I ate and drank and then laid down the purse and was about to go out, when she said, Where are you going? To wherever it may be, I replied. Don't go, she said, but sit down. I did as she said, and she asked, have you loved me so much that you have spent all your money and lost your hand? I take you as my witness, and God is the truest witness, that I shall never leave you, and you shall see that what I say is true. Then she sent for the notaries, and when they came she said, Draw up a marriage contract for me and this young man and bear witness that I have already received my dowry. They did as they were told, and then she said, Bear witness that all my wealth, which is in this chest, and that all my slaves and servant girls are his property. This they did, and I accepted the transfer of ownership, after which they took their fee and left. She then took me by the hand and led me to a closet, where she opened a large chest, telling me to look at its contents. I looked and saw that it was full of kerchiefs. This is your money which I took from you, for all the kerchiefs that you gave me, each with its fifty dinars, I put together and dropped into this chest. Take your money, for it has been returned to you, and today you have become a great man. It was because of me that you became a victim of fate and lost your hand. For this I can make you no fair return, as even if I gave my life, it would not be enough by way of repayment. Then she added, Take charge of your wealth, and so I transferred what was in her chest to mine and added my money to what I had given her. I was filled with joy. My cares left me and I got up, kissed her and thanked her. You have given your hand out of love for me, she said, so how can I repay you? And she repeated, If I gave my life in love for you, it would not be enough and I would not have settled the debt that I owe you. Then she made over to me by formal deed all that she owned, dresses, jewelry and everything else. She spent the night with me, distressed by my own distress, until I told her all that had happened to me. After we had had less than a month together, she became very sick, and her illness intensified, until after only fifty days she was removed to the next world. I made the funeral preparations for her, buried her, arranged for the Quran to be recited over her grave, and distributed money and alms in her name, after which I went away from her tomb. I then found out that she had left a huge store of money, together with properties and estates, and among the storehouses was one filled with sesame, some of which I sold to you. I have been too busy to settle with you over this period because I have been selling off the rest of the goods, together with everything that was in the storehouses, and up till now I have not finished collecting the purchase price. As for you, you must not refuse what I propose. I have eaten your food and so I make you a present of the price of the sesame that you have with you. You now know why my right hand was cut off and why I eat with my left. You have done me a very great kindness, I said. The young merchant then asked, Would you like to go with me to my own country? I have bought trade goods from Cairo and Alexandria, so will you come? I agreed to this and arranged to meet him on the first day of the next month. I then sold all that I had and used the price to buy more trade goods, after which the young man and I traveled to this country of yours. The young man sold his goods, bought replacement stock and went back to Egypt, while it was my fate to be sitting here tonight when all this happened to me, a stranger. Is this not more remarkable than the story of the hunchback, O king of the age? The king replied, 
I must very certainly hang you all. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say.